My name is Valerie Ellis. I'm an artist. I make oil paintings. So my parents are both English and they married in England, emigrated to Australia and I was born there. But they got divorced when I was very young, so I don't remember being in Australia at all as a child. I was taken back to England by my mother and grew up in England, so my recollection of growing up is all in England. children like to make marks and scribble and colour and that kind of thing. Some children persist with art and others ditch it and you know, go outside and I persisted so um, I developed, a, a beca I think because of the talent you stay interested in it so I continue to develop and I was the child at school that other children asked to draw them a picture or draw them, that kind of thing. When I Following on from the sort of talented thing, I had a bad time in school, so most of my exams I struggled with. I, I went to my art exam just assuming I had to turn up and do something and that was the end of it. So I turned up and we had to do a life drawing, which is very challenging. I remember finishing the life drawing and going to leave and the art teacher saying, well, where's your portfolio? And I said, what portfolio? She said, the one you're supposed to be making all year long. So I had attended all the art classes and still never picked up that I was supposed to be making a portfolio. So I, she let me stay in the art class for the rest of the day and I painted and drew and wrote and that kind of thing and submitted an entire year's work from one day. And I passed, but in fact, I got the highest mark in the country that year, which I, Obviously, it's indicative of talent, but I didn't continue on with art. I got, I got into Epsom College of Art, actually. I think she helped suggest that as a direction and submit a portfolio and all the rest of it. I got in, but I'd had a really, really unhappy childhood and a really hard time in school. My school was very aggressive and um, at one point I was assaulted and had a black eye from um, school, which I don't think is really uncommon in some areas but I'm, I'm not a really rough and tumble kind of person I'm quite sort of a um, middle class naturally kind of person so that was a big impact on you to be assaulted so for me although I think art was clearly an obvious forward direction that I should have gone in I, I felt very bereft at the end of my childhood and really struggled and felt very alone and so instead of continuing on with art, even though I got into art college, I actually kind of almost ran away to Australia with a, a, a very unconscious idea, I think, that if I went to Australia, I would be happy. If I went to see my dad, who was in Australia still, I would be happy and things would be better. So instead of going in that direction, off I went to Australia. My experience, I suppose, of childhood was of being very, I think, startled a lot of the time by being the way I was spoken to, the way I was treated, either at one end sort of completely ignored and neglected or at the other end of the spectrum sort of being physically harmed. And so for me, the goal was to feel safe and feel loved rather than oh, I'm great at art, I'll pursue that. That was quite a luxury idea that you could do what I would call self-actualization, like fulfill your potential as a person. I was really coping with a sort of neglectful and abusive experience of childhood at home and at school. So when I went to Australia, I still didn't pursue art. I, and unfortunately I couldn't stay living with my father because he turned out to be quite unpleasant, similarly minded person. So, 
I ran away actually from him a few months after I arrived in Australia and eventually I found ordinary sort of jobs young people do, flatmates and I um, got a boyfriend who gave me a book, a book on psychology and personal growth and it was really a, a profoundly life-changing experience. I, For me I always remember it felt like I had walked through life with my eyes shut or my hands over my face and had no idea what was going on around me or in fact what was going on inside of me either, like there was no introspection at all. And so having read this book, it just changed my perspective. It made me wake up and realize that there were patterns in life and causes and effects and feelings and an inner world that was affecting your outer world and having had that insight and that it felt empowering. For the first time I think in my life I felt empowered and that I, there might be some hope for a sense of control over life and some happiness. I decided, right, I, I want to become a therapist, I want to become a psychologist, like the person who wrote the book, because they seemed like someone who had it under control. They knew what was going on, they understood things. So for me, I think it's a little bit like a conversion experience where something comes and saves you and you think, I must keep hold of this thing that saved me. So I eventually went and did psychology. Uh, I went to university and studied psychology and, and graduated and became a therapist. So for me anyway, virtually impossible to pursue um, sort of fulfilling my potential. It, it made it so that what I had to do was repair myself and recover from childhood. And I spent 20 years as a therapist. So the other thing that it did was delay any career in art by decades. Um, so yeah, it, it was quite a negative effect. So and, and, and only a few years ago, maybe five years ago, I started feeling like maybe I'm now the kind of person I would have been if I hadn't had such a hard childhood. Maybe now I can pursue that idea of fulfilling my potential rather than just recovering from that. So I started to teach myself oil painting based on the recollection that that clearly was a talent I had and that I, I think after all I should be fulfilling it. It's an aging thing. I think there's a moment when you realise, and everybody, perhaps everybody does, that you're not going to stay in your 30s and 40s forever. You're not going to sort of um, plateau forever and live forever. You begin to age, and once you see that on yourself and realise from realizing that you're aging you realize that at some point then that must end and you're going to die at some point the end point of life starts to become more vivid and once you realize there's an end to something how you spend your time between now and that end becomes very important i mean it's, it's just like being at a party you know oh it's coming to the end of it oh i better do anything i wanted to do now because it's, it's over soon and so you get to a certain point where a horizon starts to appear and you want to fill the time between now and that horizon with something that's important to you. So I think it was something chronological that uh, prompted the decision, right, okay, well then if you, if you believe, if I believe that my talent is up, if I believe that my potential is that, if I believe if I had had a great childhood with loving parents, my life would have been art and it would have been fantastic then um, you can either continue where you're going, which is the life that compensated you for the child, for a bad childhood, or you can try the life that you think you would have had if things had been better. So that's what prompted it. It's sort of a revelatory moment that dawns on you at some point, I think. What psychology did for me was make me see patterns. So what psychology did was make me realise there's meaning behind things. There are motivations, meanings, symbols behind things that, that give life meaning, that are covered up or hidden. And 
um, once you understand them, you are in a more powerful position to understand what's going on around you. So I think in my paintings, I'm, it's very important for me to include meaning. Um, and I'm currently working on incorporating more symbolism into the painting so that it's not just something attractive, it's something meaningful as well. I also think a lot of my, if I ever struggle with a painting, it's usually between how dark or light to make it. And I think without getting too psychological, there's a, there's a fight between the dark and the light. There's a, there's a, um, a, a debate between the past that was unhappy and the future that might be happy and whether to be pessimistic or whether to be optimistic and that comes across in a painting, a moment in the painting deciding should I go darker or lighter with the painting and I, maybe, maybe it reflects this idea of should, is life hard and should one be cynical or is life good and should one be optimistic and maybe probably it's both. I started painting still life and I think a lot of people do because the thing sits still for long enough for you to paint it so if you paint a bowl of oranges it can sit there for days <laughs> for you to get it right um, but I quickly moved on to people I think people I've tried landscapes they don't interest me people keep seeming to be what I want to go back and paint and what I want to get good at so people are the hardest thing to get right uh, a, a face is you have to be extremely correct to, for other people to recognize a face as being what it should look like so painting people is a challenge that refines you as an artist it improves your ability to look and translate what you see into an idea that then goes through your hand onto a paper, piece of paper so I like painting and drawing people because it, I know that it improves me but I also think they make very interesting subjects for paintings. I think other people want to see paintings with people in. Um, also, I've been working on abstract painting. And at the moment, in the future, what I want to do is combine both. I want to combine what abstraction does with figuration and see what I can create by doing both. I think oil painting because it's traditional, so I'm fairly a traditional person, a little bit old fashioned maybe. So I like oil painting because it comes from that genre. I like oil painting because it gives you time. Anyone who's painted with, certainly with watercolours and acrylics, there's a very short amount of time to get it right. With oil painting you can, you've got days and weeks to mess around with something and experiment. I like the glossiness and the depth you can get with oil paint and I think other people sort of respect oil painting a lot in comparison to other mediums. Um, so I think the first person who really stood out profoundly as an artist was Mark Rothko. He's uh, an abstract expressionist from the 1940s and 50s, the New York School in America, and his paintings are the first ones that make you, or made me realize how incredibly profound a painting can be. I mean, his work is so powerful, it almost forces you to respond. So that's the moment where I think it dawns on you, wow, painting can be profound, it's not necessarily about being pretty, uh, I like a more contemporary inspiration, Cecily Brown. She does this idea of sort of combining abstraction and figuration. But I really like her attitude. When I've seen her in interviews, she does a lovely job of explaining her paintings. She has some interesting ideas about composition and subject matter that I found really inspiring and really directional. Um, in terms of perhaps something a little bit more classic, I like, I think it's John William Waterhouse. He, he's a pre raphaelite painter and his compositions are incredible. So complicated and uh, sophisticated. His color palettes are 
beautiful, sophisticated as well. And he, for the era, he, I think he does a very sensitive job of depicting women. Uh, because in art history, women are object, well in history in general, of course, women are very objectified. But I think he did a very good job of being sympathetic towards women as a subject rather than over-sexualise them or over-objectify them. So those people at the moment I really find inspiring. I admire Philip Guston, who similarly had a hard childhood and he struggled to cope with that. He went straight though from his childhood into painting. So he managed somehow to to keep going into art, even though he had an abusive childhood, although he did spend a lot of time coping with it by drinking a lot um, and struggling in his relationships. So, but his the work in his middle career, his abstracts in his middle career are, are beautiful, and his ability to have had that childhood and keep going anyway is impressive. I admire. I also admire. Charles Bukowski, he's not a painter, he's a poet, and he had a horrible, horrible childhood, very abused, and like me, he actually struggled even to get going. So for a long time, he worked in menial jobs, he tried to write poetry, stopped for long periods of time, drank heavily, not implying that I do, but he drank heavily because that was a thing guys did back then to cope with being abused and having a hard life. And he did, he had a really hard life, definitely an alcoholic and terrible health problems as a consequence of coping with that, but eventually got back to writing poetry and wrote incredible poetry, which for many years was still actually rejected. So he, he managed to get going with it, but couldn't get recognition for a long time. And I think it was in his fifties before anyone recognized it, which is so, so devastating to know what you're meant to do and not get any response from the world till so late in life. It's such a tragedy. But he wrote amazing poems and was eventually picked up by um, uh, magazines and wrote several books and was eventually lauded as an incredible poet, which he was. So, you know, he I admire him because he persisted. He kept going even though he was crippled emotionally from his childhood and eventually found recognition. So I admire him for doing that. At the moment, I just finished a series of paintings that are pure abstraction. I called them the context series. And what I was interested in was exploring the idea of what the background does to the foreground. So if you were to paint a red area and a blue area and you do brown marks across that, those brown marks look quite different on the top of the red versus the blue. And I remember doing that and realizing it really reflected my experience in psychology as well, that people, let's say they're the foreground, they're the, the, they're the brush stroke, are deeply affected by their, their surroundings, by their context. They change, you look brighter or duller because of your context, you look more important or less important, you feel big or small in the context you're surrounded by, and the same is true with a brush stroke in a, in a painting. So it really struck me as a fascinating experiment in context in if you make a mark and for example if you outline it that mark looks profoundly different if you just outline it versus having it plain so it really really for me underlined my one of the overarching principles i learned as a therapist which is that people are profoundly influenced by their context what's around you shapes you and and highlights you or restricts you so that was what I recently finished. What I'm doing next is combining figuration with abstraction. So I, I um, explored abstraction. I like figures. I've done those. And I'm looking at how to combine both. To what extent do you want recognition in a figure? How, how much can you pull it apart and abstract it before it disappears completely? How much 
if you see something, does it matter? Does it make the painting more interesting and deep or not? So figuration and abstraction combined is what I'm interested in exploring going forward. And particularly at the moment, composition is standing out as an issue. How, how to make all of the elements on a painting fit together in an interesting way that gives you a, a whole. So I've gone from relatively small works to moving to quite large works. And as you get to a larger scale, composition actually starts to be more of a struggle and a bigger deal something that you have to think about more and plan a little bit more than if you're just doing a face in the middle of a painting. So in the future, it would be lovely actually to be picked up by a gallery back in Australia because I have a connection back there, as well as having a gallery in London where I'm near. It would be nice to have a gallery in Australia and maintain the connection back there. And I suppose a fantasy would be to have a gallery in New York pick you up and to have a representation over there because there are centres of art in the world, New York, London, Berlin, um, probably Tokyo. So it'd be nice to be represented in those places.